Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. We've been seeing the Drifter and Eris' relationship build up a lot over the last year. We heard a lot about Drifter's side of things in the Season of the Deep. We heard about Eris' side of things in the Season of the Witch. And now, in the Season of the Wish, we get to tie a bow on the whole thing. Eris and Drifter's commitment to each other is in place, regardless of what happens with the Witness. It's worth remembering the trial that Eris previously went through and how it lends context to her relationship with the Drifter. Previously, she was under an immense amount of scrutiny as she was transforming into the Hive God of Vengeance so that she might fight Zivor Wrath. Practically every single person in the Tower and the Coalition forces were starting to question Eris' loyalty and were creating an incredible amount of extra stress for her. She of course expected this, and it didn't change the pressure of the situation or her resolve. Even when Ikora, who was most concerned for her friend in this situation, fell into the same trap of showing that she didn't completely trust Eris to walk out of this unscathed, there was one person who was still steadfast in their commitment, and that was the Drifter. Today I'm going to give you all the context of this relationship's seeming fruition after the Season of the Wish has given this little extra lore entry that tells us where Eris and the Drifter are going in the future. In all the frustration and darkness, there was one person who really got Eris's predicament, and it was the Drifter. Even as she was literally transformed into a Hive God, he was unshaken and accepted that Eris's duty and area of expertise absolutely aligned with this. This is a moment which really shows that he's the kind of character who understands where his lane is and when he needs to step out of it and when he needs to stay in it. And this moment was one of the latter, despite how extreme it might seem. There's often this idea that your partner should always come to the rescue, and that might seem like the healthy thing, but it's also well worth knowing that you might not necessarily be helping the situation. Ikora is an example of someone who means well, but doesn't necessarily do this exact thing. The Drifter, on the other hand, knows what he doesn't know, and understands where he needs to leave Eris to just do her thing. And you can see that thanks to the lore from the Season of the Witch, in particular the Kept Confidence. Take a listen. One way or the other, I'll be there. Drifter. Drifter wiped the sweat off his brow and the grin off his face. His shoulders slumped as he stepped down from the platform in the derelict. The gambit match had ended in a hard-earned win. The next match would be in a few minutes. That's all he had. He cleared his throat. His voice was hoarse. Drifter looked up at the swirling mass of Egregor, and his thoughts shifted back to Eris Morn. They'd found a little comfort with each other. A little understanding. But what did it look like, he wondered, when all that chitin burst out of her? What did it feel like to eat up all those tithes the Guardians were taking for her in the field, in the Crucible, in Gambit? He'd read the reports. He saw the theories on Vannet. He didn't trust them. He trusted her. Drifter nodded to himself and took a breath as he heard the Guardians assemble behind him. He stepped up to the platform, flicking his jade coin. It spun in the air, catching the light before falling into the drifter's waiting palm. You ever eat hive eyes? He asked with a smile, twisting his wrist around and slipping the coin back into his sleeve. Real juicy. They go pop in your mouth and a shiver runs all the way through. <laughs> I'll tell you when you're older. He winked. The assembled guardians watched him in silence. Transmat firing, he called out, and they disappeared in a burst of light. We can also see a moment when the Drifter and Eris spoke one to one, and a more personal dialogue on this exact issue is actually revealed. This is also back in the season of the Witch. Take a quick look. Hey, Eris. Heard we have some, uh, strange bedfellows. Though, if a bedfellow ain't strange, then they're probably not worth having. So it seems. Have you come to urge caution? To advise against temptation? Nah. You know what you're about. But I'm wondering, what's it like? 
It begins as a feral surmise, a suspicion. I hear whispers, but they are in my voice. It rises until I am screaming. I make a demand. An atavistic fear now sublimated into a singular, desperate urge. A hunger I must endlessly sate. But the Hive are not afraid. They are awestruck. They know that I am vengeance. And they have conjured me back with vengeance. Ooh! Sounds like a wild ride. I seek to subvert the Hive's flawed logic. I may only do so because of what I am, and what I am not. It is a wild ride. Hey, I'll be there when you're on the other side of this. As will I. Trust. Now the season of the witch is over, and the season of the wish is over too, practically speaking. As a result, Eris transformed back and gave up the power that she potentially could have taken, refusing to become the thing that had caused her so much pain, and denying the Hive their own logic in the process. Eris and the Drifter have little more that they can do now other than prepare for the witness and what comes next. But one thing has been made clear for them both, that they'll face that future together. The Drifter, in particular, isn't planning on running. We can see all of this in particular thanks to the gloaming journeyer Sparrow from Season of the Wish. The lore for this Sparrow reads as follows. We follow paths obscured. The path to the Witness is within sight. We do not know what shape Riven's bargain will take, but I know that we too will not make that crossing." Drifter listened quietly as Eris spoke, her voice tense. The dark tendrils flowed thickly from beneath her bandage. I watched as those closest to me edged toward oblivion, Eris said, her hands restless in her lap. Ikora, Mara. I am unused to helplessness. She looked to Drifter, her mouth a tight line. When she spoke, it was in a ragged breath. It's happening again. We will be alone at the end. Drifter stood after a quiet moment. Eris watched him curiously. He reached out and took her by the hand. She rose, following his silent urging. Then he put his arms around her. She tensed. He began to step away, unsure. But then her arms came up and she clung to him for a desperate moment. She felt the words in his chest as he spoke again. I remember what you said. I think about it more than I should these days. What did I say? That we'll live in the night if we have to. We do it for what comes after. Eris nodded and sighed. The pair parted, but he kept a reassuring hand on her arm. So, this is where you wish to be, she said cautiously. At the end of all things? Nowhere else. No more schemes to leave Sol? He was quiet for a moment then shook his head, smirking. Nah, he said, and looked into her eyes. I'd miss the moonlight. I made a little commentary on this back in my video, which started things off in 2024, but I think one of the more important character stories this entire year of Lightfall has been about Drifter and Eris and their development. Of the two of them though, I think the more dramatic development has clearly come from the Drifter. 
His entire life prior to everything that happened with us and the Vanguard and Eris has been made up of thousands of opportunities to cut and run, and at almost every occasion when it's advantageous, he has taken those opportunities to cut and run. This is another moment where it might have seemingly made sense at the beginning. He has stayed in the system for a long time, but has been working more closely with the Vanguard over the last few years. All of this perhaps so that he can get a better idea of the changing tides, and see when darkness is truly coming to Sol. This might have been his equivalent of an early warning system, so that he might be able to see when everything is actually starting to reach a boiling point. And maybe there was originally a plan in his mind which would have allowed him to simply slip away from the system and hunker down until the chaos was over. But of course, knowing more about what the final shape is and what the witness intends, it's clear that this plan would ultimately lead to nothing. His plan for the longest time would have simply been to take the derelict and leave. But now things have changed. And I don't think it's simply for the fact that he can no longer wait out this storm. His change, I think, is, of course, partly because of Eris. He lives now like the rest of us, knowing that we are only able to do so much to impact our future, and that there is never going to be a chance to outrun the final shape if it truly is brought to fruition. He lives now in the knowledge that as he walks towards whatever fate brings, there is only realistically one thing he can hold on to with some certainty, and that's hope. For the longest time, he has spurned everything that didn't help him with survival, everything that was frivolous. The only thing that he kept, which was beyond this sentiment, were his keeps, the strange bits and bobs that litter the derelict, and even some of those strange keeps such as his own wild egregore plant contained behind the glass, have some practical purpose to them as it turns out. But in this moment of change, knowing that he can't outrun the final shape, the Drifter has instead seen that underhanded survivalism is not the only thing that he needs. He does not need to simply survive, he needs to live. And that change, the willingness to commit to another person, is a remarkable thing when you understand the weight of the Drifter's past. This relationship that will develop and form between him and Eris is perhaps one that will be tested in the future, and yet I would be unsurprised if it remains as rock-solid as ever. Eris and the Drifter built understanding piece by piece, one moment at a time, and ultimately that has led them here, to a place where now both of them have chosen each other. They are staying not running. And for the Drifter in particular, that means a lot. But that appears to be it. That appears to be the story of Eris and the Drifter and their blossoming romance. Something that may seem completely impossible to some, given that both characters have for the longest time been unable to focus on anything other than the fight that has sustained them or allowed them to survive. But now, at the end of all things, both of them have thankfully been able to put down that which has kept them at bay from what they might truly allow themselves. This little journey that started back in Witch Queen and the Season of the Haunted has now come to a conclusion, and wherever things go next, wherever Eris is involved, you can expect that the Drifter will also be in tow, and vice versa. However, that's all from me for now. Tell me what you think is going to happen in the future. I think that there is a potential moment of conflict arising whenever Zivor Rath re-enters the story. To say that she has a little bit of beef with Eris would be the understatement of the century. So if ever there is a point at which we are in a position to take on Zivor Rath, I would imagine that Eris is going to be front and center for that conflict. Will this cause some internal conflict for the Drifter, who for the longest time has simply been trying to survive and well, may still have those survival instincts telling him to not chase the Hive God of War. Who knows? But personally, I think these two have been through enough to know that they are a rock-solid foundation. The Season of the Witch in particular proved that for me, and maybe it does for you too. Either way, let me know what you think down below in the comments section, and if you want to help feed the algorithm, go ahead and do so. Uh, it's comments, likes, subscriptions, all that good stuff that really assists 
and helps me to know that these kind of videos are still the kind of content that you guys want to watch. With all of that being said though, thank you very much for watching and know that as per usual, your viewership as always is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.